the best, not for the CNFR. Um, luckily, we aren't putting money into the sports ranch, so that would be a definite positive. But yes, it is the businesses in Casper, the hotels, the shopping, the restaurants that are making the money. And it's been my feeling all along that those people need to be stepping up because those are the ones that are actually reaping the profits of what the rest of us are paying for. So I, I sympathize with you along those lines, uh, Kyle, and uh, I've made no bones about that at times. So I hope that didn't rain on your parade or anything, but uh, those are actually the people that are making the money. Uh, well, Mr. Mayor, just to put a little sharper point on this, um, when it comes to sales tax dollars, the state uh, takes 69% off the top that the city that the city generates, if you will. Exactly. That our community generates. Yes. Uh, on that basic four cents. So when it comes to things like talking about a 60-40 split with respect to MRG, why is it that the localities have to come up with 60% and the state comes up with 40? When in fact, a large part of the economic benefit that comes from these kinds of programs are in sales tax dollars. Exactly. And the state already takes 69% off the top with regard to that windfall that we generate locally. Yes. So my hope would be that we can have a larger discussion about inverting that partnership where the localities are, are not as exposed and uh, perhaps the MRG becomes a little more sustainable over time if indeed it's going to be a feature of our economic landscape from now on. I yes. hope not. I think we all hope not. But if it is, why can't we consider that a little more favorable towards the localities? It's exactly. confusing to me. Thank you for the 69%. I couldn't remember what that was, <laughs> and I forgot to bring this, the great sheet that uh, Jill brought forward the last time I asked about that. But yes, I think, do we even get a penny out of the four cents? As a quick question, if you don't mind me asking our. Do, do you mind if I try to restate the question? Go for it. For four cents, do we get a penny out of a dollar? Is that what you mean? Or... Yeah, basically out of the four cents, do we even get a penny of it? Well, I tell you what, we, we can we can fully unwrap that conversation if, if at, at another time. Uh, and budget might be the very appropriate time. Very to good. That up. But if, if it's okay if we sit on that question a little bit. That's perfectly fine with me. And, and what and what really brought that up was Amber's comment about we're the ones that are getting the, the revenue. Actually, the revenue is split once it gets to the county based on populations around the county. So all of the outlying communities are getting a portion of that tax money that is collected in Casper. Yes, I said most of the benefit. I said most of the benefit, not not all of the benefit. We all know the state's getting most of it. Yes, but but again, no. the Mills and the Evansvilles are getting no. their proportionate share based on population yes. of what's generated within Casper. So yeah, so we are generating money for them as well. So I wanted them to make sure that they understood that we are generating through our economic economic growth that we are generating money for them. Can I ask my question? Can I ask my question? Oh, I'm sorry. I had you there. I'm sorry. Thank I apologize, you. Lisa. Thank you. For starters, I want to just say thank you for the Fly Alliance. Um, I think that out of all of the reports that we've received over the last several years, this one I felt was just the most comprehensive and it gave me the most information and it helped me understand things. Um, and then question for Carter, this $400,000 that they're asking for, where is that going to come from? Is that general fund? Is that one cent? How are we going to? Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, very fair question. Uh, we would recommend that the uh, $400,000 be budgeted through direct distribution, uh, in, which, in, in which case we do have a balance that would be able to sustain that um, we would not view it as an operational general fund type uh, liability. Thank you. That's everybody's questions. Are we in favor of 
following the city manager's recommendation of the 400K. <laughs> we're making a we're giving our thumbs up to approve the allocation or we are going to lump it in with a further talk about putting to get a, a budget for it like yes. it's yes to four hundred thousand dollars over the course of next year right now we're taking that lower right now yeah because basically that's going to come during the budget discussion of how we reallocate do what yes, yes sir I think we I think we do need to clarify that if indeed you do give us direction tonight, that is consequential direction with regard to the conversations that will take place at the state level before the end of April, wherein they will consider that a commitment, even though logistically that would be an FY25 insertion. So I'm hopeful that if council gives the direction tonight, we can count on that with respect to the downstream conversations that happen at the state level and that MRG then becomes fulfilled. Thank you for the clarification. So. OK, Chai, give me a thumbs up. OK. Yeah, sorry. I don't know why oh, was that a, my camera's oh, was that a thumb on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my camera's on, but it's a black screen. But yes, thumbs up for me. It's not a black screen here. We see oh, you. you. Can see me. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. I can't see myself. Great. Well, thumbs up <laughs> in virtual and emoji format. No, the owl has been going on and off up here, so that may be part of the issue as well. So uh <laughs> we will go from there. You're on the movie screen. Everybody can see it. You're yeah, you're on the big screen. <laughs> to your audience. So it looks like we have a thumbs up for you, Carter. Thank you. You bet. So looks like the next thing on the agenda is the veterans part. Yes, and uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could, before our folks from the Alliance leaves, um, I, I don't know, you probably know this, but most of the folks on the Alliance board our volunteers, you know, they have other jobs and so on, and they come into this environment <laughs> completely on a voluntary basis, which I applaud them for <laughs> and thank them for. Um, it, it's not an easy job to come to us or the county or anybody else for that matter to talk about the MRG because it, it is not an easy conversation. And so I just really want to thank them for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And yes, and we promise we won't eat you. So and and we will still we will still speak to you tomorrow in a nice tone of voice. So <laughs> thank you for coming. We appreciate it. So Mr. Mayor, as it relates to the veterans park, I, I do want to recognize that we have some veterans with us tonight, and I appreciate their being here as well. They are also volunteers to uh represent a very important aspect of our community, as you might imagine. Um, and as a matter of fact, have been uh, hand in glove with us in these conversations as it relates to the improvements we want to make at Veterans Park. And so I'm grateful that they're here tonight to help us with this conversation. <clears throat> I also appreciate Zaleem and her team, uh, Randy and so on, that, uh, that have brought these important changes forward. The basic idea tonight, Mr. Mayor and Councilors, is we do need to make some changes over Veterans Park. Uh, the Veterans Park that I'm talking about, now that we kind of have two, if you will, is the one that's closer to the downtown area, uh, sort of in the Second Street corridor, if you can imagine that in your mind here. Um, there are a number of, thank you for the exhibit, Courtney. Uh, we have a exhibit here that shows you the layout of the, of the park, which you probably all recognize. Um, we're in a situation where we've got some literal crumbling infrastructure taking place. And uh, not only is it a disservice to those who go out there to, you know, to, to recognize veterans and to recognize foreign service and so on, it is, it is actually becoming a, a, a public safety hazard not in the sense that people tripping, tripping over rocks and that kind of thing, although that could happen. Uh, we have a lot of nefarious activity that with the improvements we're proposing would help to curb. And, uh, and that, that is sort of the second tier of what we want to try to accomplish 
with respect to the uh, to the ideas that we want to give you some insight on tonight. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Zulim and Randy have been contemplating these changes. These are changes that we can do largely in house. Uh, we have visited with a couple of veterans associations who uh, have given us a thumbs up and have even been willing to help us from a funding standpoint to do some of the larger improvements and the larger recognitions that need to take place in this space. So uh, I, I would very much say this is a partnership project, project that, uh, that we're very, very happy to undertake here sooner than later with your blessing. Uh, hand in glove with our with our veteran neighbors. However, Mr. Mayor, if I could, I'd sure like to turn some time over to Zulim and Randy to walk us through what some of those changes would include and entertain any questions that you have so that we can get moving forward in haste if you approve them. Mayor, <laughs> counselors, thank you. Uh, we'll keep this fairly brief. City manager already pretty much set the table in terms of the needs. We have some ADA improvements that are needed, um, some safety improvements that are needed in terms of lighting and the concrete structures in the park are really the primary focus right now. And so it is our intention uh, to go in and do some of the demolition work that needs to be done in order to clean up the park and prep the site for some future enhancements. What you're seeing on the screen and in your packet in terms of a plan is really still tentative. Um, it's in its infancy and we will continue to work with our veteran partner agencies uh, to develop the best plan moving forward in terms of uh, the types and additional of additional memorials that may be included in the park and where they would be located. Um, but this really demonstrates at least the primary objectives, which is to add accessibility through ADA parking and uh, an accessible walkway from the parking into uh, the sidewalks and the other paths within the park uh, to remove the concrete structure right now that creates um, a circular seating that is really in disrepair and creates sort of a, a safe haven for um, activity that is out of sight um, and so maybe less desirable. Uh, and then there are some definite improvements that need to be done to the lighting to appropriately light flags and memorials uh, within the park. And so those are our three primary objectives. Again, uh, we felt like putting this plan together addressed all of those things, but we want you to understand that it remains fluid as we continue to work with our partners on what the best use uh, of, of the space is and where it makes the most sense. Uh, to place memorials and recognize uh, service members from a number of different conflicts, um, both past and present. So with that, I would entertain any questions you have. And really, we're just asking for permission to start uh, demolition of the site sooner than later, understanding that it will be in a state of unfinished enhancements for a little while as we're pulling together um, the final plan and some funding uh, to complete the work. So, Michael, yeah. then I'll get you, Jen. Thanks, Wimba. Um, just a, uh, one question I had was, if I understand the, the memo correctly, you're, you're not requesting any additional funds. It's, it would come out of your operating budget for 24, 25. Correct? Mayor, Councilor, yes, that's correct. So the park's uh, operating budget has park improvement dollars built into it. Uh, we also have capital dollars with park improvement projects or that are allocated to park improvement projects that are sort of fluid that gives us the flexibility to address the needs in various parks as they arise. And so we are not asking for additional funding. We would absorb that into current budgets and future proposed FY25 budgets, as well as what our partners are able to bring to the table in terms of donation or fundraise dollars. Thank you. I appreciate it. I fully support the improvements. Jenna. I just want to say thank you. Yes, I'm in support of improving that park it's a long time coming it's a host to a lot of undesirables um so i think the improvement in lighting and tree trimming and all of that should help with a lot of the activity that's going down there so it's a park that i always appreciate especially when it's lit up with the flags and paying remembrance to all that so i um i love the idea i'm looking forward to all the other enhancements in the future and see that the funds. I like it. Improve it. 
clean up downtown. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank you Zulima, for the information. Um, Don't forget you. <laughs> uh, I guess personally, it's kind of a shame um, that we didn't talk about this because uh, I think it was just last year that Dean and uh, his crew erected the memorial over at Zonta Park. And so it just seems like a potential missed opportunity to maybe combine those efforts and either place a memorial <laughs> at Veterans Park or maybe uh, uh, relocate Veterans Park to Zonta Park. Uh, you know, it just seems like there could be potential or uh, might have been potential for collaboration between there. I was curious, um, Veterans Park, what what does the usage look like at Veterans Park? Um, how do user groups use that venue? Are there events held at that venue? Because um, uh, as has been mentioned, I, I work down the street, and unfortunately, it could be a result of just the features that it currently exist, but it doesn't appear to be veterans using the space a lot of the time. It appears to be host of nefarious activities and other things. Um, and so I just want to make sure that um, the, uh, the enhancements will be a benefit to people and not just uh, obstacles to, you know, evade um, people's gazing eyes as they drive up. Mayor, Councillor, thank you for that question. And I might invite Dean down to, to sort of speak to how the veterans groups are using the park at different times. So um, as you can imagine, or, or maybe you don't know, but we don't have counters at parks. We don't really have any way to track the visitorship to our various parks throughout the community. Um, and so we can anecdotally say that we do uh, note a number of different events at the park throughout the year. We have been contacted by um, you know, national agencies who select Casper's Veterans Park as their Wyoming location to tour, whether it, you know we've had motorcycle companies that are related to veterans and different things uh, reach out to us and say, you know, we're encouraging people to stop at Casper Veterans Park as the Wyoming stop for this year. So anecdotally, we know that the park is absolutely utilized at times for um, veteran related events and for the commemorative purposes that it's intended for. Uh, we actually feel that unfortunately the other activity that's happening in the park right now is deterring its intended use. People are less likely to go um, because of the disrepair of some of the features and the safety concerns. And so we're really trying to address those concerns so that it can be used for its intended use more. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Councillors. I think the part of the biggest problem with Veterans Park, as far as being able to hold events there, is the lack of parking. So that's just an inherent problem. But we're glad to work with the Park Department, try and clean it up, get rid of the, the stucco building or built that's there now, and improve. We we'll work with other organizations to try and improve on the park. Uh, the handicap access is going to be a big benefit. So it'll be an ongoing process. Uh, I was working with uh, Commissioner Ivanhoff and uh, Senator Barras's office. Uh, they want to be involved as well. So uh, we'll work with them in the future along, uh, along with the parks and, and the council as far as how we can make better improvements and make better access for people to get to the park and, and be able to utilize it. Thank you. Uh, follow up for Dean if I can while we go. Thank you. I appreciate it, Dean. Um, and since uh, it, uh, you're sort of a spokesman uh, for the veterans demographic in our area, I'd be curious. So the reason I asked the question is because uh, coming up further in our agenda, uh, there's a request for um, helping to pave the parking lot over at Zonta Park so that folks uh, we can improve access and stuff uh, for usage of that part. It's possible that um, uh, we may only be able to fund one of them or uh, if any of them. And so my, I guess I was trying to get at with what limited funding we have available, if I didn't make it clear in our previous discussion uh, that it is indeed very limited, how can we maximize the value to the people that uh, are wanting to uh, recognize and memorialize our veterans would it be better to pave and add amenities at Zonta Park or would it be better to um, enhance Veterans Park because that you just alluded to the parking 
there's nowhere to park there. There's like three spots maybe in the alley kind of area. So there is nowhere to park there. Um, so that's, that's the intent behind my question is, how do we maximize the value of what limited funding we have available for either of those parks and all of our parks in general? Um, which park do you see as the most value? Um, I guess that's my question. Well, as Zalima alluded to, a lot of this is going to be budgeted already to remove that structure. So that part, I guess, is basically coming out of already funds. Sure, to demo it. Right. The enhancements, though, will be a huge yeah, budget that, request. Depending on, I mean, we're looking at donation of, we've talked about possibly getting uh, benches from like the Rotary Club or somebody that, that could donate benches to replace the seating area that's presently there. And then we discussed about uh, possibly adding another one of the archways or arch standards that are there to honor our global war on terror uh, since that that hasn't been represented yet so you know that that wouldn't be coming out of city funds and you know we'd be likely if you guys want to <laughs> donate money to it but, but we think we could probably raise the raise the funds to to add that to the park uh, another another option was to put a gold star mother's statue in the center of where the seating area is to honor all those mothers that lost their sons in war. And so that was something that we were going to we'll discuss further on. But the if you want to go ahead and discuss the onto part, that part uh, I've talked with Randy and Lima and. Uh, Chad Rogers and what we're trying to do is hopefully be able to get the uh, city to just basically labor. So if we can get the use of like the rotor mill machine to go down and mill out the existing gravel and prep it, then we can get buy in from in kind work from like Knife River and, and uh, mobile concrete to come in and 71 construction said they would help us to pay, pay for the paper so we could have that expenditure on us rather than the city picking up that bill. But it's, I mean, it does benefit the city because in a year it'll revert back to the city as your responsibility as far as the park goes. So we wanted to try and hurry up and get that parking lot done so it enhances the look of the park and it makes it a lot easier for the handicapped to be able to get out of their cars and get to the memorial to be able to actually read the names and, and enjoy the park while we put it there. So, Thank you. Could I sneak out one last follow up? I'm just begging. I'm, I'm greedy because <laughs> um, I appreciate that context, Dan, uh, Gene. So you still think uh, the Gold Star Memorial, the arch to uh, memorialize Afghanistan and Iraqi wars, you still think uh, it's valuable to have those at Veterans Park and not instead maybe enhance Zonta Park. Because uh, again, uh, I'm not a veteran. I don't come from a veteran family. So again, I'm speaking uh, from a total lack of experience here, but at least Zonta Park has, it's integrated with the trail system. It uh, has a river view, uh, lots of opportunity for contemplation. Veterans Park is just a bad location, in my opinion. There's no parking. It's at the corner of a three way intersection with a lot of heavy traffic. It's just not uh, when I think of a place to go contemplate and eat my lunch. I do not think of Veterans Park. It's just not. Uh, it has visibility, but not it visitable. Have, sure. Yeah, I would agree. Very. Uh, yeah, a lot of I see it, which is great. It's just not a great opportunity to go sit and, you know, um, use it, I guess, is my opinion. And we, we discussed that discussion a while back with uh, Patrick Sheehan with Rassel's office mm -hmm. and Kelly Ogdenhoff about, you know, why doesn't Casper have a bigger veterans park someplace so we could go and have events. There'd be plenty of parking and that's why we utilize so much on the veterans cemetery. But it's like, <clears throat> you discuss, okay, you really shouldn't have a veteran celebration at a cemetery. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, events that need to be held there for a reason, but to, to have a, a, a nice event where everybody can sit around and talk and, and have some adult beverages and 
that kind of thing. It'd be better to have a, another park, which I would love to work with the city in the future to maybe find a, another location. Uh, Zonta Park, if we moved everything from Veterans Park over to Zonta Park, I don't think we gain that much. I mean, area-wise, the park's not that much bigger, and we gain a little bit on parking if we can get our parking lot completed this year. But there again, it'd be nice to find another location for an actual, and we talked about maybe putting something up closer to the cemetery or, you know, where land is available that we can sit down and discuss with you all about at a future date, because I know parks cost money. You know that. And so it's 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 maintenance on the parks once you designate it, then it's it's up to the city to have to kind of maintain it as far as maintenance and everything and trees and grass and all irrigations and <clears throat> problems that come with having a park. But uh, you had a question? Yeah, and I was kind of on the same page with Kyle on this. I'm curious, rather than two, wouldn't it be better for us to focus our parks money on getting you guys one <laughs> good location? Maybe we should just go. <laughs> <laughs> it's. I mean, I'm. I'm willing to. We all are willing to sit down and and we can pick. I kind of like we did with the 13th Street project with the memorial, is we went through a lot of different parks and where where we could put it, where would be the best location, and, and we're more than happy to do that with. What the city has available now. I mean, in my little mind, the, the area up there off of Metro Road and Bryant Sock Trail, that's, I'm not sure if that could be incorporated. I know there's some issues as it used to be a landfill, but, you know, there's, there's possibilities out there. And I don't, you know, if you want to sit down and, and discuss them, you got my ear. Since I cut in line anyway, yeah. Yeah. Really, was this ever was this included in part of the master parks plan where maybe you've already made some of these determinations? Mayor, Councilor, uh, that evaluation is still occurring, so we haven't gotten any results or recommendations from the consultants yet, um, but certainly that programming evaluation is happening right now. Is it my turn? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have just wore brighter colors or something. There you go. Um, <laughs> as much as I, I would like to see the improvements of this park, and I know that we're sitting on a lot of underutilized parks, and I do agree that the Veterans Parks really, we need a bigger park. And I, not only do we need a bigger park with ample parking, but I also think that having statues and things to really memorialize the veterans is is paramount and so i think that it we don't do i believe that we do a disservice to our veterans in honoring them and then back in the day 20 some years ago when the wars were going on i do we took the girls about troops there to tie yellow ribbons and things like that to honor veterans and things like that the park, however, is not conducive at this point to for for things of that nature. I would like to look at some other land or parks that we can maybe utilize for the veterans instead of maybe find a better spot for them. Nope, nope, nope. I stuck my name on the list. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> When do you anticipate the park study being done? And currently, the schedule is to have a draft report in June uh, that will be out for public comment for 30 days, and then we anticipate uh, hopefully approval by this body sometime in July or early August. Thank you. I thought that was something that we ought to know along the lines of what you folks are talking about. So that was why I wanted to stick that in there. Now, <laughs> go ahead, Kyle. And then, <laughs> um, my understanding is you just asked him for direction for the demo, right? Tonight, um, and I personally don't have the issue with, since I kind of got off uh, us off on the segue. I personally don't have any issue with the demo. The infrastructure there is not conducive to the health and well-being of our community or the veterans or anyone. So, um, I don't see an issue with that. Um, and I do think it's important for us to kind of hold off 
on, uh, you know, uh, making allocations for park stuff until we get a chance to check out this draft. But I just wanted to let this body know, uh, like at this point, I just do not think that's a great location for a park. We talked recently about East Dale Park, about how huge that park is and how underutilized it is. <laughs> I just think we can, if we're going to make enhancements anywhere, um, uh, I think we could, I, we should at least very seriously consider other locations that will be a lot better suited for folks to hold events, to park, to, to do the activities that um, we'd like to do at Veterans Park, but are just constrained due to its location and everything. So I would make a motion. I would I would ask for a thumbs up from my colleagues for the demo. Um, but I do think we should talk about this more come budget. I'm just going to make a comment along the same lines. I don't want to derail the timeline that has been presented to us from the demo standpoint. I do think there might be room for a more holistic conversation about it. Um, I am eagerly awaiting this park study because I feel like it's come up like a number of decisions that I feel like we could make better if we have that information. So I'm really looking forward to getting that. And unfortunately, the timing doesn't align super well with this upcoming budget cycle. Um, so we may have to do you know, some guessing around it. But I do think, um, you know, uh, perhaps before we invest money, maybe we should see what that comes back. If, if that's possible, I don't know what the state of the park will be like once the demo happens and what type of timeline we would be looking at for a larger scale project, you know, I, I think that there's some probably some that you know that may not be realistic to, to do the demo and then hold off. But but um but if there's a better solution, I would certainly be open to looking at that because I, I do agree, you know, if we spend money at this park, um I think it, it, it needs enhancements obviously to make it even viable, but is it is it worth it or is it better spent to, to put it somewhere where there's better access and you know that sort of thing. So I, I'm I'm in support of Kyle's uh, thumb, and uh, but but I I wish that the draft was to us sooner so that I could have more information at my disposal right now. Yes, no. Miss Haskins. If you nodded at me, I wouldn't have to. Talk. <laughs> I guess really what I'm I think we're all in agreement that maybe this isn't the best place. For you to spend your money either so i guess i would ask that while we're waiting for that master part or yes the master plan maybe you don't put anything here until we all have a minute where we can sit down and decide based on what zelina brings us with this plan maybe we have a part better suited don't waste your money hold on for a minute so that we can try to get you the perfect part yeah i guess i think we're all in agreement that the veterans deserve a perfect park and if it could not be opposite side of town maybe that'll help you out too yeah and that that's fine we're we're not in any rush to get anything done when they presented the idea about renovating the park so get rid of the, the wall park we were just coming up with ideas of what to put in place of it so that we utilize the best part of the park what it stands for so and nothing is written in stone by any stretch of the imagination so yeah if we if, if we go ahead and just get rid of the the eyesore and and level it out and then we can work on some unification on later on is, is fine with us well basically if i'm hearing what the discussion has been sounds like demo needs to happen regardless of whether we spruce up where it is or move it is that a reasonable assessment, then I think we're all in favor of going ahead and doing the demo part. Is that a true statement? OK, and are you and it sounds like you folks are amenable to going ahead as well as the city manager. I'm speaking for you as well to go ahead and wait till the park study comes out and see if there is a better place before we go ahead and and put funds either through your donations or the city, either one into um, either there or potentially a better spot for it. Is that? Well, Mr. Mayor, just to, to be clear, um, we, we do not want to leave the current Veterans Park in a state of 
being undone once we do the demo. And so we will still need to put some money back into that park to make it accessible, to make it, you know, to where it's not a hazard and 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 still represents even even if it's on the interim uh, appropriately for those that come to the park to you know to participate in the uh, the features there. So. Thank you, Mayor. To that point, um, have we done any sort of analysis to determine if it's something that would be suitable for private development or, you know, um, taking it off the city's kind of inventory list? Mr. Mayor, we have not. No, we have not taken any of those steps at this point. So are we OK to go ahead and do the demo with the in interim maintenance to where it is accessible and not a not a public hazard? We don't need to go out and put police tape around it to keep people out. Is that a is that a reasonable assessment? I want to do that. That's correct. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. You folks happy with that as well? Yeah, that's where we discussed in the meeting. We have the city manager and the parks department was exactly that. It's like they'll go ahead and demo the the sitting structure now and then do the ADA ramp and that kind of stuff to make it more public usable and then uh, we'll work on an idea of the future on if we're going to keep it, how to improve on it, and if we work on the same plan of getting together with all the organizations and and all interested parties of moving it to some other location. We're all good with that too. Very good. It sounds like we're all in agreement with that then. So Thank you. you've got thumbs up to continue with that plan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you folks for coming. And I and Larry, I still owe you a phone call. <laughs> That's okay, Steve. <laughs> I think we covered it. Yeah. No. Looks like the uh, special projects application discussion for the eighty five thousand is next on the agenda. So do you have something to tee that up? Yes, sir, if that's OK, uh, Your Honor. Um, yeah. As Council is aware, uh, you requested a series of applications from a limited scope of applicants. Those applications have been received, and as you know, it's oversubscribed just pursuant to the $85,000 that Council made available. So uh, the hope is that tonight, Council will have uh, reviewed the applications and will render direction as to how you'd like to see those dollars distributed. Very good. Anybody? <laughs> I'll throw out one, and I know there are a couple I think that would probably go along, but I would just as soon keep the 85 to go to Metro. Next comments? I, I agree. I, I'm sitting on that group, and I know the, the seriousness of the needs up there and the, the scope of um, funds that are needed. Um, not to mention the sort of like in, intensity with which they're needed. Like they're needed immediately for a number of very urgent issues. Uh, my only question is like to what extent do we feel comfortable you know this was allocated initially as nonprofit dollars and we would be changing sort of that scope it's obviously within our purview to do i just wanted to get a sense i don't i don't necessarily have strong feelings about it one way or the other i just want to acknowledge that if we did allocate these for nonprofits all of the other applications would fit into that realm and this one doesn't of course but i don't have i don't have a hard and fast opinion about it just wanted to gather the temperature in the room on that. Any other comments? Oh, I guess I'll I throw do, out that. Mayor. Oh, OK. Go ahead, and do Jay. Go ahead, Jai. Oh, thank you. OK, let me lower my hand. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess just going along with what Amber said about, I mean, recognizing the need that that Metro has. Um, uh, but also I do I do think that it would be a strategic shift and a and a policy shift um, away from the discussion that we had 
um, in terms of how we allocated and and determined what these funds would go toward. Um, I think that it's it's very visible um, and it's an acute situation. What what's happening at Metro? Um, Eighty five thousand dollars will help, um, but it you know it's obviously not a solution to the problem. Um, I guess in my opinion, though, um, I don't think that that we should make that shift away from the determinations that we made. Um, I feel pretty strongly that we should keep it within the realm of the nonprofits, and um, and I and and I would choose to to keep the money with uh, food for thought. I just think that it it might not be as visibly acute in the way that we see the need at Metro, but I think when you know there's eighty five thousand dollars worth of food and and resources for children in our community um, that that need access to to that kind of nutrition, um, I think that's that's what I would prefer that this money go toward. I just I think that there is strategic value in enhancing our community by supporting kids who don't have access to essential nutrition. And if we don't support them, um, you know, we we pay the consequences as a community um, now and down the line. So um, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of of keeping keeping the money uh, within the nonprofit uh, distribution kind of policy choice that we made. Um, and I would advocate for it to go to Food for Thought. So those are my comments. Thank you. <clears throat> I think you had yours, Amber, Lisa. So we've only been giving nonprofits for 20 some years, correct, Carter? I think that's right. And so the one cent from its inception was always meant to go towards infrastructure, roads, sewer, all of that. And so the fact that we have changed over the last 20 years, and then when we had allocated, we, we intentionally cut some of the nonprofit due to the fact that we're trying to work our way out of contributing to that much towards nonprofits. And the public, wanted us to even contribute even less than what we did. They were wanting us to get rid of 100% of that and put it towards the infrastructure. And so that's what our constituents had said. That's what they want. And so I believe that this is just another effort into doing what our constituents appointed us to do and not give this to the one to Mormon nonprofits and then so I do believe that we just need to apply this towards Metro because there is a desperate need and the city, we just do not have the money to build a new Metro right now. And, and we're just suffering every single year, every single day. It's just constantly suffering. So we need to, to be able to put some money towards that. I threw out the 85 to Metro, but I do remember along the lines as well, and you alluded to it as well, that basically when we had been giving to some of the nonprofits, I remember back when we gave money to Food for Thought and it was to buy a truck. So it was for capital expense. Um, and that was one of the things that we have looked at in the past is, is this for their day-to-day -day operational expenses or is this actually for capital expenses, which would be more of a, a one time type situation? And basically, when I look at most of these, um, there's two of them that, that flat out state that they're for salaries and operational expenses, which to me, that isn't what we don't use it for that. And they ought to be able to generate their own money for operational expenses for their overhead for their salaries and if they can't do that maybe they've got some other issues with some of their fundraising activities but i do like the idea of the churches and the nonprofits trying to help support a lot of these functions and so that's just another comment along the lines of 
historically where we've come from as well. So I guess outside of Jai, where does everybody else stand? I know Kyle, you have mentioned Metro. Lisa's mentioned Metro. I was for Metro. Did you have a comment, Michael? Well, yeah, but go ahead if you want. Oh, no, I just kind of trying to figure out where we all stood. Okay. You know, <laughs> I, I, I struggled with this a lot, but uh, I am just kind of, I mean, this is truly, to me, like an ethical dilemma because, you know, to me, the, the situation as was described at Metro, to me, feels and sounds like a, a health and safety issue, not just for the animals, but for the employees. And so, struggling with that and, you know, feeding hungry children, that's a, that's a dilemma. <laughs> and so, but I, again, I think the thing that kind of sways me the most is uh, the fact that that Metro is a, it is an essential city service. It's a primary responsibility of the city. And so to, for me, that Metro kind of outweighs all these others in my mind. Questions or ready to vote? I have words. Do you have questions? Just words. Words? Sure. Go ahead, Kyle. And then we'll go to you, Brandy. That's OK. We'll work our way around. Sounds good. I appreciate it. Um, so Councilor Pollock's first point, the fact that we had originally allocated this for nonprofits was my biggest hesitation about it. Um, and um, so that's uh, also the Councilor uh, Sutherland's point. She, it seems like that's definitely one of the factors playing a role in her decision as well. Um, so I agree that has legitimacy. Uh, but I do think in light of some of the recent conversations we've had, um, we've just recently approved it was like 120 grand for the uh, additional kind of, I don't know if portable is the right word, but expanding our capacity up at Metro. That was kind of an unanticipated but necessary expense. Um, I believe during the initial round of one cent allocations, Casper Senior Center was looking for like 400,000 a year in meal costs, straight hard costs for food. And I know we didn't give them the full amount for that. And so, uh, and that's despite the fact that that's a city owned facility over there. And so um, while I totally agree with Councillor Sutherland that the food insecurity seems to be on the rise, I think that's what all the stakeholders um, that provide those services are saying. Um, and that's something that we all need to be mindful of. <clears throat> on the flip side though, um, you know, Casper Senior Center, they were looking for us to help reimburse for meal costs over there and that's at a city owned facility and we still didn't give them uh, anywhere near uh, the full amount that they were seeking for for the uh, for that and so to me it's not a black and white thing I, I totally um, uh, you know recognize that there's a couple different positions you could take on this and stand totally justified that um, you're taking the right one but I, I do still believe that um, just due to the dire need at Metro and some of the discussion points I'd raised earlier in this meeting about just deferred maintenance and us needing to catch up on uh, City of Casper infrastructure. That's why I'm going to continue supporting it for Metro. It's just a drop in the bucket relative to the needs, but um, that's how you fill the bucket, one drop at a time, I suppose. Ms. Haskins. So the way I'm looking at it in my mind, while it's not a nonprofit or not for profit, it's certainly not something we're running to be profitable and it's never going to be profitable. So in my mind, it's not a 4501C, it is a nonprofit. It's city owned nonprofit. We have a couple of those, but <laughs> this one has a dire need. And I'm pretty sure that if somebody said, hey, city of Casper, we want to open a nonprofit and take over Metro, we wouldn't be like, oh no, this is our favorite thing. <laughs> I'm sure the chief would be okay. So in my mind, it's a nonprofit that we're running. And so I don't have any qualms about using the allocated money for it. And I don't see a need greater than what we have at the Metro right now. So I'm 100% on board with that. Jai, go ahead. Now get to you, Amber. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess the way I see this is that, I mean, we're in charge of, of the budget and we we set aside 
some money for Metro outside of this allotment of funds, and we cut the funds already um, from what we were historically providing to nonprofits. And, and I think it feels clean maybe to say we don't support nonprofits, that's not our business, but we do want a thriving and sustainable community. And part of that is partnering with our civil society organizations who provide essential services to people in our community. We do that all the time. And Food for Thought already was a recipient of this money and, and we've made an adjustment now. And this is $85,000 that's now, they'll go, have to go fundraise to, to help feed kids in our community. And the Metro situation is our job. Like that shouldn't be something I don't think that we take from money that was allocated as essentially like supportive side funds to these organizations for one of our jobs. Like if we're not funding Metro appropriately, that's on us. Um, and I think that we need to talk about that in the upcoming budget discussions. And it just, I don't, it just actually feels wrong for me. Like we're covering ourselves um, by not allocating enough to Metro in the first place, which actually in that discussion, we, we, made an adjustment and allotted more money to Metro for this purpose outside of these, you know, just over $3 million, um, $3 million that we wanted to provide to our social um, community partners. And so I just, I, I get that there's logic there, but I think we're undermining our policy goals and our community commitments if we just take this money and then put it toward uh, an institution which we could make budget decisions about um, in the in the coming weeks and days. And so I yeah, I'm I'm just like strongly um, opposed to the Metro and I know I'm just one person, but um, and it's fine. I'll, I'll support the council. I, I, I think we need to do so much more for Metro. I, it's not a matter of not supporting Metro. I just think the ramifications for children who do not have just like animals do not have say over where their food comes from. Um, I, I think the ramifications are important and, and that we should consider the consequences um, when we can make different policy choices um, in our up upcoming budget conversations if Metro is such a priority. So I won't say any more, but you guys know where I stand on it. Amber. Thank you, Jai. Do it. You can take me off. Okay. And <clears throat> Ray had sent me a text earlier. He is in favor of Metro as well. So just to throw that in there for whatever that's worth. So I guess. Can I say like food for thought takes in from this revenue detail? It looks like what they take in a half a million a year. <clears throat> and, you know, I I get it what everybody is saying and I'm in the nonprofit sector so my heart does lean over there but in the other part is this is Metro Metro's a wreck right now <laughs> I'm not happy with Metro <laughs> for several reasons and they need to take care of it and they need to clean the place up whether it be you know the kennels the accommodations the HVAC the septic the sewer everything over there needs to be taken care of right down to staff probably you know <laughs> And this is just a situation that is continuously needing improvement, and we do that. But I don't, I'm torn. Like Jai is and some other people, well, Jai's not torn, but other people are torn in between whether to give to the nonprofit or to do Metro. And right now, I feel that with everything that Metro does need that money, and it is a city service that we do provide, but you know, it's not. These different nonprofits, they're not entitled to these funds and they have other, they're not struggling, struggling. They have options. They have grants they can do. They have other things that they can apply for. And this is our money. And it just goes back to, I think, the infrastructure thing and kind of along the lines of what Kyle was talking about is where we need to clean up what we have and what we own and maintain it. It's not 
that this is it's a hard choice for us to make, whether it goes back to a nonprofit, which, yes, it all goes back into our community. But these, again, are infrastructure things that actually need to be worked on, too. And we get that money from our city and our taxpayers, and it should go back into what we already have, I think, being that there's other sources that nonprofits can apply for, for that same fund. So that's my two cents. I'm leaning towards Metro myself. Any other discussion? Oh, oh. I guess I'm as ready as I I feel like a real traitor to my duties as a liaison to the Metro Animal Services Group because I, I, my my biggest concern up there right now, particularly with this item, uh, is the city staff we have working up there and the the air quality, and I think that that is um, that weighs on me really heavily in this decision. Uh, however, I agree with Jai. I feel like we put we put a lot of good work into creating a good mix and a good balance for how these funds are spent. Um, and we didn't, you know, we, we, I think we were conservative when we allocated to nonprofits and we were expecting, you know, certain community outcomes and results by allocating at the level that we did. And um, so, you know, to, to reduce that and, um, and reallocate to a different purpose um uh, yeah I, I agree i think it it does undermine our the goals that we had with allocating any money there in the first place and, and makes those you know it, it less likely that we'll achieve the full um you know, potential that we were hoping to achieve by uh setting aside some amount of money for nonprofit support so um <laughs> i uh i think from from that standpoint just philosophically i i will support um, Ron and Cooper thought as the original recipient of this and the original intention of the funds um, with a great deal of uh, uh, conflict and regret thinking about the conditions at Metro and, uh, you know, what I've been working on for a year <laughs> with that committee. Well, <clears throat> I guess basically Who's in favor of food for thought? I know Jai would be. Amber, okay. Who's in favor of giving it to Metro? Looks like we will go ahead, based on this straw poll, we will go ahead and go with Metro. Looks like the direction, Carter. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate the difficulty that that was as well. That's never and, easy. And again, I don't think any of us took this lightheartedly. I know a lot of us expressed feeling here in the meeting. I am sure that a lot of us thought long and hard about it over the last couple of weeks as well as we've been waiting on these to come in. So I do appreciate your thoughtfulness. I appreciate your concerns. I appreciate uh, the care that we care about. Um, I do know that I think the rodeo is going to be doing a food for thought night as well, so that uh, they normally do that every year. So hopefully that will help them out some. So we do appreciate that. And while while we're talking about that, and I know it isn't on the agenda here anywhere, but I do want to express the cities and the councils, I'm sure, thoughts and prayers <clears throat> to the families that were involved in the incident Sunday up at the mall. That was a very tragic situation, and we really need to get behind our community and particularly the see something, say something, and the social media bullying needs to cease and stop. Um, I personally feel that social media is the scourge of the young people and that when I was growing up, if you wanted to bully somebody, you had to face them face to face, man to man, woman to woman. 
that has gone beyond that now and you can turn it into a dog pile on some some person that does not deserve it at all and uh, i am very disappointed that nobody stepped up nobody said something because i know there had to be more people that knew about it than the few individuals who were actually involved and i am disappointed that nobody said something along those lines and i think i speak for council all the way along those lines so while we were talking about that, I felt like this was a time to interject those thoughts. So we will try to continue on. Um, Sports Ranch is next. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you're seeing a theme here, I think, with regard to <coughs> a lot of money discussions. Um, I want you to know that all of these discussions are really, really helpful as it, as it that uh, relates to the budget that we'll be presenting you here in just a few weeks. And so uh, uh, I appreciate that. This one's a little different in that while it certainly does have budget implications, it probably would be one that would be the current budget that we need to address uh, this possibility in the form of a partnership with the folks at the sports ranch. Um, we, we've been hearing a lot of wonderful information about the project and uh, one of the pieces of information that I just received is that indeed they do anticipate opening the doors of this uh, uh, wonderful facility in uh, January. So the, its opening is imminent. And uh, what's I'm sure very challenging is with regard to the fundraising that is still ongoing in that uh, there is a, a $53 million spend happening right in front of our eyes, which is all just incredibly exciting. Uh, the question that Council is uh, uh, entertaining tonight is whether or not you would be uh, a partner with regard to a part of the project that remains a city asset in the form of the West parking lot. Now, when I say a partner, I, I do mean that in that uh, a lot of the heavy lifting for that project, that part of the project, the West parking lot, has already been undertaken. So that means, uh, as you probably have witnessed, um, the uh, the base course is in, the electrical work is in, the uh, the concrete work is in, all the flat work, all of that is in. Uh, luminaires will, will be in if they're not already, uh, medians and so on. A lot of that work that is usually very expensive the parking lots has been undertaken by the sports ranch. The question before you tonight is whether or not you would be opposed to taking on the paving of that lot and uh, and moving forward in, in that respect. Uh, my hope is that um, the $400,000 that's needed for just the paving portion of the lot would not be borne alone by the city. It would, in fact, be uh, a partnership between a number of entities, uh, not the least of which Advanced Casper has already made known their willingness to participate on a cash basis. Now, let me let me talk about the city's participation here just a little further. We've talked about four hundred thousand dollars that would be needed to finish out the parking lot. That is relegated to the purchase of the asphalt that would be needed for the uh, the full extent of the of the parking lot. Um, however, the city would also be participating in an in kind way in that uh, we would use our folks, our equipment to make that uh, make that installation happen. The uh, the hope is that with regard to what it is that Advanced Casper will bring to the table. I'm hoping it will be $200,000. It may not be, however, their, their uh, entities still need to consider that. If not, however, my hope is that I can pursue other partnerships to where the total exposure for the city would be $200,000. That's, that's my goal. And uh, we then would be able to uh, complete that, that, that asset. That improvement would all be the city's to own and uh, certainly uh, with regard to 
the spirit of partnership that we've talked a lot about tonight would be made manifest in the completion of this uh, this wonderful improvement that the event center will get to use, the public will get to use, and certainly the patrons at the ranch would also get to use as well, which was the, the original spirit behind the improvement. So with that, uh, Your Honor, my question is whether or not we can move forward in performing this, this improvement. Uh, we really need to probably get this done before the fiscal year concludes in that when the uh, the base course is 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 final and the uh, the um, sensitivities with regard to the way in which that uh, base course is applied um, would not be lost in the form of other weather events and so on that might impact the space we're talking about. So we're hoping to get on it quickly in this budget year if uh, your blessing can be obtained. Good question that I have. That was originally a gravel parking lot, basically dirt parking lot. Is that correct? That is correct. So in essence, what you're saying is we would wind up with a paved lighted parking lot for 200,000. That is what I'm saying, essentially. Yes, <laughs> you're, you're right. Your Honor. Discussion. Tom, you, did you have something, Jenna? No, I was just giving a thumbs up. Oh, OK. Uh, Carter, do you mind explaining? We didn't get a uh, map or anything uh, as part of our memo. The west parking lot is that the middle gravel parking lot. There's three of them, kind of northern. Is that the one in the middle between West Boulevard and whatever this other street may be? Sorry, I'm Google Earth and over here. But yeah. uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilor, I think your description of the of the, the lot in question is correct. Okay, it it, it really is the largest. Uh, most central lot that would essentially be north of the paved lots. A, a lot of folks refer to, to it as a cowboy lot historically because that's generally where we see a lot of cowboy rigs being staged during CNFR and so forth. Um, it is definitely one of our largest unimproved mm -hmm. lots that we have used historically. Thank you. Follow up if I could. Um, was this uh, in the initial negotiations with Lyle Sports Ranch, was this ever broached as a opportunity for partnership with the city? I guess what's the reason it's coming to us now as opposed to uh, when the leasing contracts and stuff were initially drafted? Um, uh, the reason I ask is because I felt like the city, myself, potentially my colleagues, had taken a pretty strong stance that the city would not be investing anything in this. And uh, uh, I recognize the 200000 for the $53 million investment, I did the uh, plugged into my calculator. It's not even half of 1%. So I consider it a, a win when we get a nine to one match for farming tap grants and other things. Uh, so certainly half of 1% to get a $53 million investment is also a pretty good, uh, pretty good trade. But I felt like the city and some of its representatives had taken a pretty strong stance that the city would not be investing anything. And I'm worried about losing trust in our constituents uh, with this decision. So I'm curious if this was, I, again, um, um, I would have loved for this conversation to have taken place eight months ago and told people it's a very minor school and uh, middle school investment from the city as opposed to saying the city will not invest anything. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, we will. Um, uh, so the time, I guess, is just unfortunate. I don't know if you can provide further context or if I'm misrepresenting, but that is my concern. It, Mr. Mayor and, and Councillor, I can certainly appreciate that concern. It, it's true that those statements were made. Um, I would tell you, however, that with regard to the scope that this project has taken, with regard to the additions that is, this project has included now, uh, was not originally anticipated either. So indeed, that ratio improved dramatically uh, consist, uh, compared to what we originally envisioned uh, a, a number of years ago, maybe even as many as three years ago when this was uh, originally proposed to the council. So the answer is no, we did not anticipate this participation. Certainly council can say the participation is not appropriate if they, if they desire to. But I would tell you, uh, despite the fact that this was not envisioned three years ago, uh, this partnership is still a very, very fruitful partnership on the part of the council, the part of the city, 
on the part of the community, on the part of the county in its entirety, and certainly even the state of Wyoming. So I, uh, I, I do not have any qualms whatsoever standing behind the proposal that uh, is being made tonight. Um, to, to Kyle's point, I guess I see a little bit of a distinction too um, in terms of uh, no city dollars going towards the, the building of the facility and that sort of thing. I do think we envisioned a number of improvements that would be needed in the broader area overall. Um, we've got a number of lots up there that I think over time there's a, a larger idea as improvements are able to be made in that area and in our on our property in that area that that we would be doing work on those. And so to, to me, I see this it's our parking lot, right? So to me, it seems um, uh, an adjacent uh, investment and not necessarily a direct investment. And I think that we we represented that we would not be investing in the in the project and the building and the, the facility itself, which which we haven't done. And so um, to me, I think I find it to be sort of similar to the investment we're looking at making development across the street where it's, it's an adjacent investment um, it's property that we own. And to, to me, it's just complementary. And I, I don't think that it was, um, you know, I, I do think it was envisioned in the larger site plan for the, the, the halo that there would be city investments potentially down the road. And to, to me, this is the first of, of those that we're looking at. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilor, just um, I wasn't uh, here at the time that that was negotiated, but we did take a look at the existing lease. And while there's an uh, obligation to pay, but it's not really an obligation within the lease that is assigned to any one party. And so um, that may provide some context at the time that it was recognized that this would be done. Um, but I don't believe um, that uh, should we uh, move forward, council moves forward with a thumbs up on this, that we would actually need to amend the lease because I think that it was written flexibly enough to where it could very well have been contemplated that the city may partner or could partner at some point on, on these types of items. So, um, you know, again, wasn't wasn't part uh, of those discussions, wasn't privy to those discussions, but the way the document is written would lend some credence to the, the perspective that some some level of collaboration on some of these adjacent issues, um, you know, could, could have been contemplated. Just a quick question, is, is there other parking that was included in the original sports ranch plan? I mean, to me, when you do a capital project like this magnitude, you, you've got a plan for parking. So there is park, other parking that's more adjacent to, it's closer to the actual facility. So this, is there, would it be incorrect to characterize it as, as kind of overflow or sport? Kind of, I kind of see that as the way it is for the event center too. That's kind of where the lake covers get you know, park. And is that kind of the same situation with the sports ranch? Or there's, there's closer parking that this just kind of adds to that. Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor, the, the, the first answer to your question is yes, indeed. There, there is an adjacent lot that's being developed and in fact, may already be developed. I'm, I'm not totally sure in, in terms of where it's at right now. But yes, it's it's very much adjacent to the building, right on the same initial footprint that the uh, the land that was leased to the uh, sports ranch included. Um, in terms of whether or not this lot would also need to be developed in order to meet the needs of the ranch, um, I, you know that to me feels more like a code question in terms of the amount of spaces that a facility of this nature would require to be improved. And, I, and I'm not equipped to be able to answer that right now. So I guess the, the, my answer is that there probably is more parking that would be needed beyond what's adjacent to the building um, that, that you can see out on site. Did you have a question, Jai? Yeah, I think so. Um, maybe, maybe two questions. Sorry, Carter. Do you mind just saying your answer <laughs> um, that you just gave one more time, just to clarify that that, or let me say what I I thought I heard you say. So there's parking that's already being developed, but this one that that we're being asked to partner on, you're uncertain whether or not it's it's necessary 
per code to to suit parking needs. Did I understand that correctly? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor, you, you did understand my response correctly. I, I do not believe the space that's being developed immediately adjacent to the building would be adequate enough to deal with all the spaces that a building of this size and complexity okay. would otherwise require pursuant to code. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess, I mean, I would be interested in in understanding more maybe before um, knowing the proper way to move ahead. I I guess I'm I'm struggling a little bit because we just had a conversation where we took $85,000 from a, you know a, a pool of allotted money and we put it toward a, a city mm -hmm. responsibility um but now we're talking about $200,000 to go toward a parking lot but the need at metro's dire so i'm just i'm trying to understand our fiscal priorities um and so I, i'd be curious um to know i mean if if this proposed partnership is not necessary to meet the parking standards, then you know I'd suggest there might be better ways for us to use our money right now. Um, but but I don't know, I, and I, and it's not that I don't support the partnership here. I, I agree with what Kyle said that that you know certainly it's it's a minor contribution to to a huge investment and and really exciting development opportunity for our community. So it's not. Like you can't pit them together. I'm just trying to understand um, maybe what the most responsible use of our limited funds are right now. It's not really a question, just a comment. Mr. Mayor, um, I, I may have misheard what Councillor Sutherland said, and I apologize if I did, but I do believe the paving that's taking place, whether we do it or the ranch does it, would be a code required amount of paving with maybe a little bit in the balance with regard to completing the west parking lot so please don't misunderstand i, I if they didn't need the paving we wouldn't have required it to begin with on yeah. the west lot and so uh i if i made the, the mistake of really making this confusing i apologize but no i do think that the paving that's required out there is code based OK, thank you for that clarification. That's helpful. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, that's a, it's not your fault. Yeah. <clears throat> Vice Mayor. Considering the substantial investment that in and, and I mean, in just what Carter had said that this is going to benefit the entire city of Casper, the state, the region. And reality is, is that I can see even maybe a few years down the road, we may need to come back and Carter's gonna have to come back to us to pave even more up there because of the traffic. So for the $200,000, this is a partnership and we're not even doing the heavy lifting. So I fully support this. No. I guess I've got to go along those same lines, and that's why I mentioned that basically we're getting a big paved, our largest parking lot paved with curb, gutter, everything lights for $200,000, which along the lines of what several have mentioned here is we would ultimately be paving it as things went on, even if the ranch wasn't there to help support the event center itself. Looks like we're getting a heck of a bargain from that standpoint because uh, we have the event, uh, the trail center, they're wanting to expand, we're wanting to expand the event center and the things we do there. So parking is going to be an issue even without the sports ranch. So that's kind of where I come from as well. So I guess in the bigger scheme of things, does anybody else have comments? And are we in favor of going ahead and spending the money to pave the lot? Jai? Not hearing you. I'm just going to hold out on this one. 
Okay. <laughs> Very good. It looks like you, we will go ahead with this. <clears throat> Speed limit ordinance discussion and follow up. Mr. Mayor, this may be one conversation that doesn't have a budgetary implication. And I'm so grateful for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> a tough night, that's right. Um, unless the city attorney surprises me. Man, I hope we don't get that. <laughs> I, I am taking, I, we are using up our time from previous meetings tonight. <laughs> so. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> this is a follow-up conversation, Mr. Mayor, with regards yes. to uh the broader context of managing speed decisions and and that really is a question of whether or not it should be more on the administrative end of the continuum or more on the for lack of a better term political end of the continuum where we take every step of that conversation to all of you to help get that direction one way or the other so we're hoping that with regard to what eric has prepared tonight that perhaps we may be able to see where you'd like to be along that continuum as it relates to speed limit discussions, changes that need to be made from time to time, and uh, and the like. So with that, Mr. Mayor, if I could turn the time over to the attorney to walk us through some of these nuances, I'd sure appreciate that. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Counselors, I, I do have to start by saying that the city manager stole my thunder. Uh, my opening <laughs> line was going to be uh, that in a stark departure from the rest of the uh, work session, this only has a potentially positive fiscal impact um, to, to our bottom line. Um, this issue first came uh, here recently before us with regard to uh, Kaufman uh, Street here in, in Casper, a uh, concern that was brought by a citizen. Um, Chief McFeeters presented uh, with regard to his um, study of, of the traffic uh, incidents on that and, and was of the opinion uh, that yes, potentially a speed limit change would be required. This got us to looking more broadly at how we approach uh, changing speed limits within the city of Casper with regard to specific streets. And um, as you can see from what is a fairly lengthy memo uh, from me that I, I went down a lot of different rabbit holes uh, trying to, to drill down on what is required um, and, and how could we potentially do this more efficiently. And so, so really that's, there's two separate issues. With regard to Kaufman, um, our engineering staff is working on a, a, a speed uh, survey, um, talked to Mr. Brower prior to the work session, and we think we'll have the results of that here in about the next week or so. Um, but with regard to how speed limits are set within municipalities, this is in the first instance dictated by state statute. Um, the state of Wyoming, just like many other states, has adopted a permutation of the uniform uh, code for the regulation of traffic. And uh, within the state statute, um, they set certain maximum speed limits for various types of streets within municipalities, within counties. Um, but then there's a statute that allows municipalities to deviate from those maximum speed limits, provided we follow a process uh, which has to be adopted through YDOT. And YDOT has adopted Chapter 30 of its rules, which outlines the, the, the administrative um, technical procedure uh, by which municipalities uh, can change those maximum speed limits. And, and that is in line with uh, national safety standards. And that includes doing some of the engineering analysis, the speed uh, traffic studies, et cetera. And, and so you might wonder, well, you know, why would they require that rather than just, you know, a local government being able to, to change them however they want? Well, you, you know, you often hear of the small communities that where you've got your quote unquote, you know, uh, traffic, uh, um, uh, well, it, zones where they're just writing tickets, you know, and so so there's some some sideboards on that. You can't just change it from 45 down to 15 and then back up to 45 and, and, and put an officer there and see it's got to be based on statistics. It's got to be based on data. There's restrictions in the state statute that allow changes only, uh, I think, six for every mile or something like that. So so that there's some uniformity uh, statewide. So, so the, the, the state statutes allow us to, to, to deviate as long as we follow this process. And the way that, that the city of Casper has done this is we delineate every 
instance within our city, um, whether it's a street or a portion of the street within our ordinance, meaning that every time we go to change or alter a speed limit, it takes a formal ordinance change, um, it, it, three readings, a public hearing, publication, et cetera. When reviewing the other municipalities throughout the state and, and, and a number in Colorado, um, we are the only municipality that requires a formal ordinance change to, to change a speed limit on a particular stretch of road. Um, it, it, within the memo, I've given several examples and, and many of those municipalities simply have adopted an ordinance that says uh, staff can change it uh, provided we follow the uh, process that's outlined within state statute. Um, others uh, require a resolution uh, to be brought forward with the study results and then uh, city council can take action um, uh, with just a consent agenda or could, could potentially put it as a separate item and have public comment if, if you wanted. Um, so there's there's a lot of other ways that are, are, are more efficient and, and less costly. And, and I try to drill down and just kind of understand, well, how, how are these other municipalities doing that without going through the formal ordinance process that we have? And I think what it comes down to is whether or not it would be considered a, de a illegal delegation of legislative authority, meaning that um, only through ordinance can can city council legislate. Um, and, and so to delineate, you know, the, the argument would be as such that by giving staff that authority, maybe that's impermissible. And I don't think it is. There's a couple of cases that I cited within uh, the memo where the uh, Wyoming Supreme Court has tackled this issue. And in a nutshell, provided their statutory authority and there are clear sideboards uh, around which that administrative uh, implementation can be had, um, it's, it's not an impermissible delegation. And, and because we have the white dot rule, because we have the, the state statute, I think that delegating it uh, either to staff or adopting it through a resolution uh, it is consistent with um, case law and, and the governing law within the state of Wyoming. So the, the direction I am seeking and, and my recommendation was would be that uh, we uh, take a run at um, drafting uh, some ordinance amendments that would streamline this process, uh, do away with the, uh, the publication um, requirements, the three reading requirements. But I did hear the last time we talked about this that the council would like some opportunity uh, for the public to, to weigh in. And so I think in that instance, uh, potentially requiring uh, staff to do those studies and then bring a resolution forward would, would, would A, be more efficient, but uh, B, would balance that with transparency and the potential for public input. So, so that would be my recommendation if council is, is um, on board with moving down that road. Um, and that's essentially, I think, my overview, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if I can. I guess my one, and I don't know if it's necessarily a question, but I guess my comment to council, because that is kind of what we heard the other night in our discussion, is that basically we go ahead and change the ordinance to where it has to go to resolution, but that resolution cannot be on the consent agenda. So that gives the public then the opportunity to have input into that discussion. I'm trying to speed the meeting up a little bit. That's why I just didn't, because <laughs> we are running long. Go ahead, Amber. And I'm actually okay if it goes on consent because they still speak at the beginning of the meeting, it still ends up on the agenda and any of us could elect to pull it off if we have received quite a bit of input uh, on that particular change. So I guess it's, for me, as long as it is on an agenda, on a meeting where the public has a chance to come discuss it, I don't have um, you know too many qualms about it either way. It, I don't know what it looks like to say a resolution always has to be off consent. Maybe that's a thing and maybe that's fine too. I don't have a problem with it either, but I would say as, to me, as long as it's on an agenda and the public has a chance to show up at that meeting and, and speak, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, Mayor, Councilor, I, I, I would uh, agree. I think that uh, to, you certainly could build something into the ordinance that says it can't be on consent, but there are multiple mechanisms for um, soliciting input and removing it from consent. I think that gives Council the maximum flexibility on how you, you might want to approach any specific item. 
If we take my suggestion off and go with by resolution, where do we stand? Jai? All right. Looks like that's where we will go then. So instead of having the, so what I believe that also does is even though we're already into, well, we're already into the traffic study so that basically we can go ahead now and just change the ordinance so that we only have the one publication, one public hearing, and then it would be a resolution after that to change yes. the speed limit. Is that? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Council, so I think the next steps would be we'll we'll put a draft uh, ordinance uh, amendment together. We'll, we'll uh, get it on the next uh, formal meeting to set uh, the first uh, hearing or first reading. Um, and assuming that kind of progresses, then in conjunction with the uh, third reading, what we'll have to do is have a resolution that uh, would, would incorporate what's currently in ordinance. And um, we, assuming the uh, data suggests that that we need to change Kaufman, that'll we can do that right at the third reading um, uh, before the ordinance goes into effect. Actually, we would need the new ordinance, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah, we well we can pass the resolution and make it effective upon the. Oh, uh, okay. Either way. Because, but, okay. Uh, yeah. Very good. Everybody in agreement with that? On to the next That's one. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Council response time for public comment. You had brought that up, Kyle. Uh, basically, I think it's a good idea. Um, does everybody understand what we're talking about? Right now we have public comment and then we wait till the very end of the meeting. But basically we don't want it to turn into a tit for tat discussion either and turn into a two hour discussion. So we happy with that? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, my personal vision for what I'd love to see this is, uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy to think uh, when some of us first got on council that there was kind of a exchange that took place. Uh, feels a little while less now thinking about it, um, but <laughs> my experience limited as it might have been, it led to some pretty tense um, interactions and stuff. And so I still think that when we have folks come speak to us during public comment, we should still have the ability to ask questions uh, to allow them to clarify the point they're trying to make. I still think that's um, uh, something that we should take advantage of if necessary, but right after public comment period ends, I think we should have the ability to address those public comments so that um, folks can hear that feedback right away and don't have to sit through a two and a half hour meeting just to hear our response. Uh, so basically you're interested in hearing them getting all the way through that and then having council discussion, but not necessarily one-on-one -on -one discussion when they're at the yeah, I do not believe we should go back to uh having a back and forth because then uh it seems like the rules of order kind of go out the door <laughs> and, uh, it, gets, it gets a little wild west i feel like at the point but i'm just trying to clarify where you want me to be in <laughs> all of this it. process as well so <laughs> okay I, I don't think it's a bad idea to have that council response time however i i am I mean, I think it needs some guardrails on it as far as I don't know if it's time limits or because I think it could very easily kind of devolve back into a Wild West free fall. And, and yeah, that's not constructive at all. I, so I think, uh, and, and especially if we get the opportunity to ask questions of the speakers, that's my concern because then they're going to get a response. And that that's the part I think that could, has, is the most at risk for turning into a, a debate um, where if it was just we listen, they, we listen to their comments, we provide our comments. Um, you know, it's a little cleaner in terms of <clears throat> if you're, you're done, you heard your comments, nobody's wanted. Well, but but again, that kind of. I have a question to his question. So yeah. as is, they're done speaking, go sit down and then you can, people can reply. Right? Would yeah, once the best? speakers, can, the speaker has. So there's no rebuttal right. back and forth. So once the speakers have all, maybe once all the public comment speakers have, <clears throat> that we get a chance to. Exactly. That's, that's what I was trying to get at is that 
Yeah, if there are five people with comments, we listen to all five, yeah. and then we have our comments, yeah. and we're done. Right, and I and I don't know. I mean, I can see the value in the opportunity to ask questions, but I'm concerned about where yeah. that could end up. Well, and, and again, it needs to be questions, not our comments back to them at that point. So that becomes our responsibility as well, that we don't try to bait them into a discussion. Yeah. If we have a point blank question for clarity, then we've got no problem with that issue. Well, and, and I think, I guess for me, the bottom line is that, that the issues are things that either should be deferred to staff to, to get back to and clarify. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I don't want to, I don't know. Because if I get a complaint or a concern from a, a, a resident, a citizen, you know, that's where it's going to go anyway, typically. It's got, I would I expect. Can't, I can't do much about it. I mean, I maybe can help clarify it, but. You know, I would that. expect 90% of our comment back would be referring it to city manager. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw you under the bus. <laughs> Very good. Did I see another? Yes. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that when we used to do it the way it was when I first got on the council, that was really all that happened was we would say, like, we'd ask Carter, he would say, yeah, that's something we can look into. And then that citizen would have sort of immediate feedback, like somebody's going to look into it. There was often an exchange of contact information so that we could contact the citizen and be in touch. And, you know, I yeah, so I feel like that works a little better than this whole long extended two hours, three hours in between, knowing if anybody even is going to respond to your concern or not. So I think it's good. I think as long as public comment closes after public comment and then we go to council comments, I, I don't see. If it goes off the rails, then that's our fault for continuing to question them. Right? I mean, once public comments close. So yeah, that's a good job. Um, so I think it's fine. Very good. Everybody OK with that? Do you have any issues with that? Mr. Mayor, I have zero issues. I just want to be sure that uh, if if we put some script language that helps set the table yeah. for that portion of the conversation, that we identify the appropriate guardrails. Um, what is if you please. have something like that before our next meeting, like something that could come out between now and Friday when the when the meeting comes out that we could all take a quick check at before I read it on Tuesday. <laughs> if that so, and, and if it's OK, uh, Mr. Mayor, we certainly can bring it to the pre-meeting next yeah, week and have you kind of look at it, make sure we're on the right yeah. track. Um, that would work. And then implement okay. it the following week, the following public meeting. Perfect. Probably, Perfect. maybe even because our next meeting is a public meeting. So if we like it, uh, if we like it in the pre-meeting, we'll go ahead and do it next meeting even. Well, I guess it depends if we look at it at the pre-meeting. And don't like it, then we'll continue as we are. Yeah. OK. Everybody OK with that? Move on then. Yeah. Oh. Heard from me a lot tonight. I was just going to say, uh, for me personally, in response to Councilor Bond's uh, comments about um, exchange, I, I still would like to preserve the opportunity to ask for clarification from folks, but I do believe that one of the guardrails should be it should be in question form. Uh, yes, because my experience was that when we got into trouble, it wasn't necessarily folks asking follow up questions. It was making declarative statements yeah. in response. That's when the back and forth. got. Yes, started. so um, I would like to preserve the ability to ask questions of folks. that do. Yes, give public absolutely. And that was the comment I was making is that we need to ask questions, not make statements. Yes. Not argue with them. Not, exactly. <clears throat> the last thing I think is me. Basically, right now. Yeah. There's, there's May. In May, we had originally talked about having our budget discussions the 20th, 21st, and 22nd. And that's a uh, Monday. And it would have carried over to Wednesday then because the 21st is actually a regular council meeting, so we wouldn't have been discussing budget then. What we're looking at is uh, there is potentially a, a DC visit to 
go over grants, things along those lines for police, fire, etc. And that we have tried since the 1st of April up until now, and it looks like that could happen that 20th, 21st and 22nd. So if we're all in agreement, we would have budget then the 27th, 28th and 29th. And hopefully if we carry over from that Monday, the 27th, we would be able to take care of the rest of the budget then for that work session on the 28th. So can't remember how this worked last year, but is it is that is that basically additional work sessions on that Monday? Yes. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Yes. And we may not have one. Well, actually the Tuesday is a normal work right. session. Right. Mr. Mayor, I would say that the Monday is probably rough because that would be a Memorial Day holiday. Oh. Is it really? Right. But the, oh, geez, I missed that. That's okay. okay. That's okay. <laughs> totally okay. That's yeah. why we're here. <laughs> Do we want to move it then to the 28th and 29th? That, that would be my recommendation. Okay. I know we were visiting about it and I hadn't even noticed that that's that okay. was Memorial Day weekend. No problem at yes, all. no, we don't need to do it on a three day weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad enough about our fifth Tuesday. I'll be darned if I'm going to give up Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> so thank you. No problem. So basically we would, in essence, try to clear anything else from work session then and have basically the 28th as our main right that would be the only item on the work session for the 28th Absolutely. and if we don't have anything if we don't get done it will carry over to the 29th yes sir yes sir everybody okay with that okay, okay. i'm getting closer to back on schedule heck that's when we we're supposed to get over is it 7 20 so we're, we're down to council around the table so everything else okay yes sir yes sir We'll start with Ms. Pollock tonight. Um, that's anything. I've been out of town, so I'm I've got all my meetings this week, so I'll have lots for you next week. Very good. Councillor Bond. So I, I have my first planning and zoning uh, meeting this Thursday. Look forward to that. Um, I did attend the almost uh, full listing group meeting last week. Um, I didn't a lot of the, the data to share. However, I just wanted to kind of share some of my observations about you know, to me. I think the. Um, the city's interest anyway, and my interest in, in, in going to those is making sure that. I mean, what kept kind of going through my mind was that our, our city police and our fire. Firefighters are often on the first line of encounter when there's an issue with, with someone who's homeless and so my kind of overarching concern and, and interest is that um that they that those frontline folks the, the police officers and firefighters have the support they need and they're getting the response from whatever agencies they're and and i still kind of i still struggle with um you know when it when there's clearly not a, a, a public, i see the need I see that why police officers are, and firefighters interact because they may need their services. They may be a public safety issue of you know, whatever where they're needed. Um, but at a, at a certain point, it becomes kind of a social service need. And so you know, the person needs immediate housing or, you know, it's, it's a health issue, a hospital or whatever. Um, so I guess I would like to see the, the group. Um, and I, th I think it will come out. This work on the continuum of care that's happening, um, I think we'll, we'll meet that hope. Um, but again, I just kind of feel like, I just don't want our folks, the police officers and firefighters, to feel like they're the Lone Rangers sometimes and kind of what do we do? And, and so far I'm not hearing that. So. Um, let's see what else. Oh, I attended the SLID, the State Land Investment Board meeting on last Thursday. That was fun to, to be there for the. the <laughs> it's fun, wasn't it? More subtle. <laughs> it's a blast. I mean, because we got money. That was so. That was good for us. 
um, the, the Colts Road uh, gravel pit. Uh, not so not so much, but <laughs> anyway, stay tuned for that too. It, it was good. It was good for the city of Casper. We got a good substantial grant there to do some of that infrastructure work. That's good. That's all. Councilor Jensen. Hi, I got a couple things on my to-do list here, please. Um, one is that you guys probably heard that the chairlift broke down over at Hogadon. And so it ended the ski season about a week short, I think, than what it was supposed to close. So I'm hoping that there is some works, something in the works, some plans for a new lift to get this so it's operational by next season. Right? So <laughs> I'm just asking if we can have a work session on that or just some information on making sure that there's some kind of progress or something can happen or if it already is. <clears throat> be enlighten us. I don't know if that just means that email or <laughs> what, but just to kind of keep us in the loop of what's happening with that, please. Um, a lot of that community has already been reaching out and is concerned that it would not be replaced or fixed by next season. So I'm hoping that it will be. Um, my other thing is, is I'm not sure if this requires a new ordinance or uh, amendment to an ordinance, or maybe there's two different things. But one is, is I'd like to look at, if we can put this on a work session or however you want, um, an ordinance that is changes the temperature of when a dog can be left in the car. Because I guess right now it's around 71 degrees. And then they can do something about it. I think that's way too hot, and especially when there's no air or ventilation. So um, looking at something less than that, and then also I'm not sure if there's a below temperature, like a negative, like a 32, you know, before when it starts getting freezing. I'm not sure if there's what that entails, but maybe just if we can take a look at those ordinances pertaining to that. Um, there's also, I'm not sure that we have an ordinance. This is maybe where we can make an ordinance, but I think it is not, I think it's neglect and animal endangerment. If you have animals that are living in your vehicle, there should be something that we can do about that. That should not be tolerated. I mean, if people can't have them in their apartment, they shouldn't be living them in their car. This is happening here and it's disgusting. So I would like to look at what we can do better for these animals that are being neglected, that are living in vehicles. So if everybody's okay with that, you have a discussion. For work session. For work session. Everybody okay with that? Mr. Mayor, I have yes, several items uh, in that list. I know. That's why I'm like, I don't know if it's an ordinance amendment, making new ordinances, or maybe it's all of it. But well, we maybe I can more. offer a suggestion. Um, as it relates to the chairlift, uh, we can easily put together a memo that discusses what happened and where we're at. And what's, what are planning? As it relates to some of the ordinance changes, I definitely think that uh, a work session will be in order in that those are fairly involved conversations. And so, um indeed that that makes sense but if you're okay with the memo yep on the other item memo is fine okay yeah Is that clarification the other something? one something yeah. else has to happen right it's not okay and then um i don't know when we have air maybe this is your camping law or ordinance that we have and i'm not sure exactly where that guideline is, but if they move a vehicle that's sitting there 50 feet up or across the street and it's still the same vehicle, does that, is there some kind of limit like you could only move it X number of times to get away with that before it's, <clears throat> you know, still considered camping if you're in the same block kind of thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, Mayor, Councilor, um, you know, I think if they're camping or living out of that, that vehicle, I, I think that's, you know, prohibited so I think moving it around doesn't necessarily change things it gets a little bit um, 
convoluted because we have some regulations on parking and how many days and it's an RV and stuff like that. But um, but uh, yeah, moving moving a vehicle 50 feet if you're living in it or a mobile dog house. Yeah, or any of that stuff should not uh, make any difference. So. Um, now we're talking animals that brighten dovetails back into the, the mm-hmm. previous. Uh, but still, people do the same thing, so yeah. it can go both ways. Sure. Moving sure. it across the street 50 feet, rolling tires up a space it doesn't constitute. Yeah, that yeah. wouldn't exonerate them from being in violation. I do not believe. Okay. Um, told you I had a to do list. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <coughs> otherwise, um, my sympathy goes out to the horrible catastrophe that we had at the mall with the kids in the situation. And many of you know that I also um, do uh, volunteer for victim services. And so I was on that call as well and helping some of the teenagers struggle with some really adult issues that they have to deal with now and some guilt and grief and trying to get them through that Um that trauma that they've experienced and it's going to be very hard and it's going to be hard for this community and it is something that is just disgusting and disturbing that that is happening here in Casper so like you say see something say something um definitely because this there's no reason for any of this same thing these you know I could go on and on but these little these kids that think that that is how they solve a problem is they've got it wrong. And if we do our job as adults and community citizens, if we see something and we let the police know or let the authorities know wherever we are, I think that is very important that we do our part. Um, I don't know. I didn't have, I mean, a whole lot of good things this weekend to share. There was just a lot of a lot of stuff that was happening here and it just kind of made me disappointed in a sense in our community. But then at the same time, I know that we can all do better and do more. And so things like this change. So I just want everybody to keep those family members and everybody in your prayers and thoughts and be helpful, be kind, be nice. Doesn't take that much to make a community happy and <laughs> the surroundings good so um that's it i think but otherwise next <laughs> i see jai in the middle so we will go to counselor jai right now thanks Councilor Steve. Sutherland, um, i mean <laughs> it's okay i can be counselor jai <laughs> um <laughs> I, I actually don't have a lot tonight. Um, I was also at the Homeless Coalition meeting, um, but as you can tell, I'm out of town and I left my notebook um, in Casper. So if there's anything that I wanna bring up from that, I'll make sure to raise it next week. And I'm, I'm actually pretty sure there was a note that I wanted to make sure to mention. Um, but I thought it was, it was a good meeting overall. Um, I think there's some, maybe some forward thinking about how we can work um, not just within the city, but partnering with the county and some of our um, state representatives to think about how we work collectively. And um, to Councillor Bond's point, um, broaden broaden the, the scope of responsibility uh, beyond just our first responders and, and thinking proactively about prevention um, and what we can do in partnership with, again, the county and the state to to move forward on that. So I'm hoping that we can make some real progress. And I think there are some good models for um, in other communities that are that are doing um, work on similar issues related to kind of mental health and substance abuse that I think are really some of the root causes of the the issues that we're seeing here in our city. So um, I'm looking forward to learning more and and doing more on that. Um, I think that that's everything from me tonight. So thanks. You bet. I hope you're either on our time or Pacific time and not Eastern time. Otherwise, no, I'm an hour ahead of time. you all. I'm, I'm an hour ahead, so it's okay. I get brownie points for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Jai. <laughs> yeah. Councillor Haskins. So 
I also was considering having a moment of a behavior this evening. And thanks for starting it. But the Kyle did. <laughs> Blame Kyle. I love Blame Kyle. I do recall a couple of school board members coming to a meeting and calling us out once upon a time. So I fully intended to bring up the mall incident and schools and, you know, maybe focus less on books and more on bullying. But I don't want to be a hypocrite. So I'm now to town for the next school board meeting. So I'm just going to leave it at that and shut my mouth and hope that they're paying attention and making plans. And aside from that, I didn't have any meetings. So I'm going to simmer my behavior and give this to Kyle. <laughs> Happy to take it. No, we can start any fights tonight. Uh, maybe next week. <laughs> it was Tennessee. <laughs> Um, I was thankful to have uh, Councillor Sutherland and Bond at our Homelessness uh, Coalition Task Force meeting last Wednesday. Um, I like stats, uh, so I brought a couple to share. Uh, the chief reported that we had zero exposure deaths this winter, which uh, I was happy to hear because we had a couple brutally cold weeks there in December. Uh, however, it does appear like the weather's turning a little bit and the quote unquote seasonal migration seems to have started. Uh, somebody that works again right next to the bus hub anecdotally, I have seen an uptick in individuals who at least appear to be homeless. There's no way to know, but uh, certainly carrying around large luggage and uh, other large bags. Uh, several stakeholders in the coalition reported a worrying uptake in uh, worrying uptake in violence related encounters and apprehensions, including our chief of police. There was just a um, observation made by many of the people in attendance that their interactions with folks who identify as homeless seem to be coming more violent. So that was something that I found concerning and will certainly be keeping a close eye on for uh, future updates along those lines. Hopefully it's not a trend that continues. Uh, we still have very high utilization of services by a small number of people. 22 of the 50 public in talk to us last month involved only six people. So that's an average of three to four arrests per person. Uh, it, within the same month and so um, it's a shame that so many services uh, it, it's kind of the 80 20 rule uh, you know 80 percent of the services being used by about 20 percent of the people but um, my understanding is that the stakeholders in that group are uh, coordinating and collaborating to provide some enhanced services for those folks We're trying really hard to divert them and raise them uh, enforcement and incarceration services and more into you know treatment recovery and prevention services Transportation continues to be a primary focus of this group. Uh, you know, the fact that we have uh, CWCC, one of only a handful of uh, community mental health centers that provides intensive inpatient treatment, WBI is one of only two psych institutions in the state. So we got a lot of folks that come to our community to receive higher level, more acute services. And mm -hmm. uh, we still have a gap in regards to getting them back to their home communities, funding that transportation, finding the people that actually provide it. So that's definitely a primary focus of this group, um, which I'm happy with because that's what I see as one of our significant gaps in service at the moment. I uh, expressed concerns that I have about our limited housing inventory and uh, trends that worry me in that <laughs> regard, such as our quickly rising home costs. I know as of a year or two ago, Lisa, you probably know better than I, but as of a year or two ago, our median average home price had raised 30% in the past three years. I think it's probably done that again. So, you know, compared to five, six years ago, uh, we're looking at significantly higher costs to get into uh, a home and uh, more people being ineligible for federally funded housing. Uh, I believe I mentioned in the past that Casper Housing Authority, when they were trying to fill out Liberty Square apartments uh, on Beverly Street, they had to go through 280 applications to fill 60 units. And so 220 people that were not eligible for uh, federally funded workforce housing, they're somewhere. Um, and if they're not eligible for that uh, uh, housing, you know, there's very few other places for them to go. And so uh, that continues to be a concern of mine, but um, great discussion in that group. And then, yeah, lastly, uh, several of my colleagues have already mentioned it. Uh, really unfortunate passing of uh, Bobby Mayer uh, is my understanding of uh, the child's name, 14 year old. Uh, very sad. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm a baby, uh, but there will be a vigil. Uh, it sounds like a David Street station Thursday night. I believe it's at 730 p.m. So if you'd like to go show your support uh, uh, for friends and family, uh, that's where the vigil is going to be. I believe there's also a GoFundMe and a meal train set up for the family. 
So you can find that linked on, uh, there's a Bobby Mayer Candlelit Vigil Facebook group. So I would recommend you go there for opportunities to contribute to the family or offer support uh, in any way that you can for them. I was glad to see that the coroner, uh, James Whips, he spoke to the Toronto County School District Board of Trustees last night in regards to bullying and the need for preventative measures, resources and recourse for children who are subject to bullying. And uh, so I guess to Councillor Haskins point earlier, yeah, uh, there's um, some things I think the community would like to see the Board of Trustees focus on, and I hope they take that direction from the community. That's all I have. Thanks. Bushmer. I was going to say some things, but everybody else covered it, so I, I'm going to pass. <clears throat> Excuse me. Spent a lot of time last week visiting with uh, some of the electeds uh, before the slip board meeting. Uh, it was a very good meeting last Wednesday morning. We received uh, $4.168 million for sewer line uh, from the State Land Investment Board. So uh, that was a very, very big win for Casper to, to be able to get that. Uh, beyond that, uh, had a tour of City Hall last week. Uh, looks like it is coming along quite nicely. Um, was very pleased with the way that they've lined it out. Well, everybody should be. It sounded like uh, a lot of staff was pleased with it as well about uh, office space, uh, community interaction spaces, um, the way things were set up from that standpoint. And the word that I was kind of hearing there is uh, we may be into that by the end of third quarter. So. That was sounding good, so maybe we as uh, council members will get to get to initiate the new the new city hall and uh, the revised council meeting room. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, beyond that, uh, tour scheduled for this Friday is that canceled? No, it's still on. Another cancellation. No, it's still on. Never. There were like three or four different dates for the meeting for the for the tours. Friday yeah. Eleven is still on. Yeah. yeah. No, all of them are still on. I just mine was last week because of other commitments I have later on. So uh, I think uh, Councillor Sutherland, myself, and our vice mayor was there. So that was the three of us last uh, last Wednesday. So that was a very good tour. Uh, beyond that. Good. You're good. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're good. We're done. Thank you all for staying. Mr. Schiffman. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate, Carter, that you allowed people to have color in their office.